So we're going to talk about that though, just about the new dynamics. And, and the, the thing is, is for, for those more experienced, this is somewhat limited because uh, I have to kind of review a bunch of things depending on who's actually listening. So um, I might not go into as much detail and I'm going to go into a lot of basic stuff also that I think is somewhat important to understand what you're doing with ultrasounds. Um, so the, this is not working. Okay. So the outline is going to be reviewed first the principles of Doppler physics, uh, then the types of Doppler, like we're going that basic, and then a little bit of the general use and pitfalls of cardiac Doppler. Um, one of the things I think very important to realize as we're doing this talk is that um, uh, there's a lot of things to, do to talk about Doppler. I selected a couple of things that are heard more on the more beginner to intermediate range of users that um, would be useful to know, not necessarily all the details, but when there's things that can make them wrong. And that's kind of the approach to this talk, not extreme detail. So first off, for just to review very quickly with Doppler, for those who don't really get the, the principles, if we go at that basic, is that Doppler is a principle that when you have an ambulance, an ambulance, because we're healthcare workers, so we're trained, uh, and you have essentially compression and decompression of the waves as uh, something is moving towards another thing. In this case, it's not a perfect um, simile, I guess, because your, your, your Doppler is the one sending and what is ref the reflector uh, is, uh, is blood. But the principle of compression and decompression of the waves the sound, sound, uh, that, that, that you're detecting is what matters most here. And that's what the Doppler, the way Doppler function, it actually looks at the shift of the waves that are sent at a specific speed through tissue that remains the same and looks at how much they shift based on the reflection against the surface that's moving. So a lot of people start with color Doppler to explain it. I'm going to try something different and we'll see how it works. Uh, but I think other understanding spectral Doppler and helps you understand color up a little bit better in some strange way. And that's because you have to first understand how the machine works. And the way the machine works in ultrasound is that when you seeing a 2D image, it's not like it's pulsing everything at the same time. It is doing it very quickly, but it's, it's pulsing a single beam across the whole time, which makes it that you have a temporal resolution that is not always perfect. And also makes that as you're getting wider in your field, you end up having less temporal resolution. The image, the frame per second is gonna be lower. It becomes important to understand a little bit what 2D versus your spectral Dopplers are. The spectral Doppler is doing a single line over time uh, I'm going to have to answer that later. Sorry, I'm on service. Um, and so uh, it's a single line over, or, over time, meaning it can go much faster than here to look at a 2D image. And that's important for later on. The B part is because some applications that we'll talk about later can, can do a, just this, a portion of it at one time. Uh, and that is probably more the color Doppler side of things. So, um, by the way, you guys see my old screen because I also have like video images on the side and I'm not too sure if it's hiding it for you guys or not. We see a special Doppler for bottom of the Okay, so nothing's hidden by camera or anything like that. Nope. Okay, cool. So um, the first thing, so it's a very nice graph done by your dear Dr. Buchanan. Uh, talks about the difference between uh, continuous wave Doppler and pulse wave Doppler. And I think the graph is really great for two things. The first one is simply the line that you see. So when you look at a machine, this line is going to be full, but most of the time, most machines. But the reality is that actually represents quite well what happens is you're sending packets down and you're waiting to listen if it comes back. And it allows you to put a gate at a specific spot and look how fast it's going at that specific spot. It also means that you can be, you have maximum velocity you can, you, you can address. And that's because you're pulsing and then listening. And you have to do that sequentially for because you're using a single crystal to, to do both things. By pulsing and then listening for relatively a much longer period of time, you're able, because sound moves at a specific speed, to know based on the amount of time it takes to come back where the actual velocity is. Um, the continuous wave Doppler works differently, and it's this would be very well by that, that single little line coming down, is that it pulses all the time and it listens all the time using two different crystals on the actual machine. But it also means that if you're listening all the time, you can't really know where your maximum velocity is because you don't know which one is coming back at what time. So basically, in the car analogy, you can know what at one spot what car is going at what speed versus which is the fastest car in the lane. Um, 
So if we look at actual pictures of what it looks like, it looks like this. You have on, uh, on the left a pulse wave Doppler, which range specifically in limited velocity because you have to listen for some time. So you have to interrupt your signal and that can go up to 200 and so uh, centimeters per second most of the time. The envelope is usually gonna be quite full in the middle and uh, quite empty in the bottom because in the, um, on the envelope, it's gonna be quite full in the middle, it's gonna be quite uh, dark because the velocities are being matched at maximal velocities. On the other side, you have a dense signal because you're averaging a bunch of different velocities. You also notice that you can go much faster and that's not even the maximal you can go. You also notice that your markers are different than both. And that represents what we saw in the last slide. And it allows you to recognize which signal you're looking, to, looking, looking at if you were to have doubts looking at the actual thing. Notice also that this is, again, a single line over time. So it gives you velocity that during the start I of the ejection of the end of the OT, and at the end. That's okay. Yeah, there's ultrasound around today. Sorry, there's a, there's a mic open. What's up? There's a, mic, a microphone open, sorry. The heads up. Um, so, um, again, another way to look at this is, is, is going to the principle of the crowd versus the single uh, person as you're, you're having a tracker on you versus your time of the whole marathon. It also dives then into the question of aliasing and what happens when you have it. And the idea of aliasing is that you're, you're sampling at different rates, usually, an, and it has to be an under rate compared to the actual speed of the, uh, the frequency, essentially, that you're trying to get. And the idea is the following is, if I'm listening at the right sampling, every time I'm looking, I will pick it up where it's at. If I'm sampling faster, in this case, than I'm actually looking, the first one, I'm gonna, ca I'm gonna catch it wherever it is. But the second one, I'll have done a full turn maybe uh, when I catch it again. And it might look like we're actually going backwards. And that's what, that's what you see when you see in movies that are going at 24 frames per second, the wheel of the car is actually going backwards because it's, it's going much faster than the actual ability of the camera to capture that. And we see that in echo as well. Now, in this situation, this is gonna be something that's very particular to pulse wave Doppler for the reasons that you're, you're able to assemble, the speed is limited. So you'll, you won't be able to catch everything. If you look, sorry, on service again. So uh, if we look at this, just to, for those who have never seen it and so on, what you're trying to do here is align with color to see where your maximal influx is. And then you align it, and I'm gonna go back here, to the area that you have the most turbulence, and that's the aliasing under color. Um, you're trying to get that because you wanna catch your, your, your fastest speed in this specific instance using your CW Doppler. There's different applications where you will go at a specific spot to catch the velocity at that spot. But that's what it is. So as you're doing this, you end up having um, your computation over time of all the velocities that you're catching at the specific spots. And you can readjust your speeds to catch the maximal impact and eventually trace all these things. And we'll get through that a little bit later. Color Doppler is what people usually teach first, but I think it also makes sense to teach it after because now you know what pulse wave Doppler is. And color Doppler is essentially pulse wave applied in a different way. And the way it works when you do pulse wave Doppler is you have a box. What that box does is it does multiple pulse waves in the whole box at different spots and it averaged the whole thing to give you a velocity. It also makes you realize if I'm doing multiple beams at multiple spots at the same time, my temporal resolution is gonna be much lower. And that's, that, that's where uh, you have limitations to your color Doppler and the ability to, to show you sometimes the maximal velocities what you end up getting is Ali is in under color. And that's that color here that seems to be fluctuating and going in a bunch of different directions because the signal is so overwhelming the ability of the, the actual Doppler to, to um, uh, process it that it starts shifting around and it doesn't really know which velocity it's going through. So it shows up at this very high color in the more brighter range compared to the very linear flow and much slower flow that you see in the red parts. That's a little bit what happens with your pulse wave with range gate versus multi-gate. And multi-gate here would be a power Doppler, but think about it as being wide as well. It also means that the wider you are, the less temporal resolution you have. Um, and that's why uh, pulse waves or single wave Doppler, single beam Doppler will usually be able to, to give you a higher temporal resolution and higher speeds as well. So the principle here uh, to remember what is what, uh, the, for the physics buffs, you're gonna hate this, 
uh, but it's the opposite of what actually happens with redshift and blue shift. It's just a pure way they've been computing it. But it, if it's blue away, if it's going away from you, it's going to code it as blue, even though in real life that would be red shift. And in red, uh, it's going to be towards you. Um, if we look at uh, other things here to give you an example of what, uh, what this could be, uh, is we have at the top um, the velocities of your mitral valve and the velocities going through the aortic output track. And here we have the uh, pulmonary artery, pulmonary valve. The reason I'm showing this is because um, it shows you that color dot plot shows you the direction. But more importantly, you have to be mindful when you're looking at specific lesions to think about which way this is going to go to understand that the color will change depending on where you're looking from. In trans thoracic, you get used pretty easily. But when you go in trans esophageal, you're looking from the other direction, then your colors are going to be inverted. So you have to pay attention to that and remember that, uh, that the colors matter. On the scale here on the left, it tells you a little bit where you're going through. If you're going towards the orange, it's going to be towards you and blue to away from you. Just pay attention to that because sometimes if you're not timing the cardiac cycle, you can get a little bit confused as to which direction and what's what. <coughs> so in summary, what it tells you a little bit is that your 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 um, your aliasing speed, where you're you're um, you're going to have that signal incongruence that can't be res uh, resolved, is going to differ on what you have. And as we said, the color Doppler max speed is going to be 60 centimeters per second. You can go a little bit higher in some situations depending on your transducer. Your single beam pulse wave is going to be 200 or so, sometimes a little bit higher than that. And your single beam is limitless because you're listening at both at the same time. Um, another great video, one other words from it might be that Dr. Buchanan was on a STARS flight and decided to do this. I'm not sure, but I trimmed it a little bit. It shows you the principle of aliasing we talked about. And as you see, as we're going faster and faster with, with the helix, I guess, uh, of, of this plane, then you start going backwards because you can't pick up how fast this is going and you're, it looks like you're sampling at a, it's going backwards because you're sampling at a rate that's exceeded by the frequency, the actual movement of the helix. That's called exceeding the Nyquist limits. So that would be called for lasing, exceeding the Nyquist limits, and this is still image for some reason. Let's move on. Um, when you're adjusting your collar, you have to pay attention to all these things. There's things you, you all these things you can't change. Some things are more obvious to change, some are less. I think the important thing when you look at this picture to understand that uh, when you're looking at actual severity of regression lesions, as an example, all these things will affect what the cell looks like because color depends on how you're adjusting it as compared to velocity when you're just pulsing through a single beam. Your color gain will affect it. If you have very low color gain, then it will look much less worse than it actually is because you're not catching you're not able to, 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 you're catching the velocities, but you're not showing them on the screen. When you're getting very, very high, you start getting signals like this here, that you may not be catching, it's not really moving, but the computer is, is, is kind of resolving things that shouldn't be resolved. The Nyquist limit is what we talked about when you start aliasing, and you can see that if I drop it very, very low, I end up having that wraparound idea where I'm exceeding the ability of the machine to resolve all this much earlier on the process. And you can see here, this would not be very turbulent if I had the appropriate um, velocity pulsing. But if I don't, then everything becomes turbulent. And this looks much worse than it actually is. The last thing you can do is addressing the transducer frequency, which is something that probably in the VC user shouldn't be doing. The machine usually is quite well calibrated to what it needs to do. But in certain situations, when you're trying to obtain uh, very specific uh, processes, then you can do that as well. The other thing to know about Doppler in this specific instance is that it is very much angle dependent uh, based on this equation. And now when you have perfect, you're perfectly parallel to actual um, flow of what's going towards you, you get your maximal velocity. The more your angle goes away from uh, zero, essentially, the more you drop your actual frequency shift that you're able to detect, uh, and the more you actually drop the frequency shift because of the angle that things are bumping against. So your velocity, the more you have the angle, is going to be, it's going to be less well resolved. And it's going to be usually, it's going, it's going to be lower than it should be. So whenever you're doing Doppler and you're looking for a signal, you need to be very careful that you're thinking where, what the direction of the signal should be, 
And am I aligned as best as I can to get the maximal velocities and maximum resolution? And this is a good example in color of what happens. This is an aorta, all right? This is the aortic arch. You're leaving here from the um, LVOT, ascending aorta. Then it becomes much darker, black, because I'm nine degrees from the flow. But there's flow there, we know that. And then it turns back to blue and higher velocities. So you have to be mindful when you're looking as an example for, let's say, mitral regurgitation, that your personal long axis might underappreciate what it actually is because your beam might be very parallel to, uh, perpendicular, I'm sorry, to uh, the actual ultrasound beam and you won't see it. You might be better off in a typical four chamber where your visual might be much better. Um, let's now talk a little bit about applications. Um, and I missed a bunch of things together that work together to talk about concepts of, of what can go wrong and go right. And, and one of the major things people talk about that's interesting is cardiac output in the aortic valve pathologies. And what do you do with them? Um, and I think it's something we have to be careful about because there's a lot of different um, pitfalls to using this. And we'll talk about all of them. Basically, when you're doing cardiac output by echo, what you're trying to do, and this is of course not you know, supposed to do, is you're trying to get an, an idea of how much flow is leaving through your LVOT. And that's your actual output coming out. What you're, when you're pulsing through this, you can pulse a PW wave, a pulse wave Doppler, right at that spot, and you actually see what the flow is going through. If you know the area of that uh, space, and you know how fast the heart is beating and how often you're ejecting, you're able to get that. So what you can do is pulse this, get a, what I a VTI, velocity time integral, which is this little thing here. And that is all the velocities over time. It gives you something in centimeters that if you multiply it through the area that is going through, gives an actual um, you know, stroke volume and then cardiac output. So um, you pulse, you trace, and you get this. In schematics, this is what it looks like. And you need to pulse at the right spot. You need to be at the spot, you're actually going to measure your LVOT. And that's within one centimeter from the actual valve, more or less. Um, it can be quite tricky to get because you first you need to get a good view in apicals if you're going to TTE. You need to angle it anteriorly to, to get your LVOT. You need to make sure you have a signal in that spot and you're not losing signal. You also have to make sure you're well aligned because if you're not aligned perfectly, then every little angle that you get past the 20 percent, 20 degree range from the actual direction of the flow will undervalue your actual um, VTI. So if we were to do that, uh, to see this again, this is where you would go to angle it exactly through. And this is actually a pretty good angle if you're able to get your Doppler line like this, and then you trace it. Um, there's a way to trace it. You have to be mindful that you're trying to get your velocities and that sometimes you have extra little velocities that are not, can be artifactual. This is the best picture I could find of something that's probably not traced the way it should be um, because you need to catch a very dense signal when you're doing this. Every time you catch a signal that's a little bit more, you might overestimate your VTI. Um, and this is probably should have been traced more in this range here, much closer to the actual dense signal, the bright yellow signal that you have that will give you something better. Try to avoid uh, the extra little things like this thing here that probably doesn't need to be in your signal to, to capture it. And then you end up when you're calculating a bunch of things, and that's because we measured things before, but your VTI would be right here in centimeters. It also gives you a pressure that can be used for calculation of aortic stenosis later on. So what do you do then? Well, you know you have an LVOT, and I have some pictures for that later. You multiply it by the radius squared times pi gives you a cross-sectional area. Multiply VTI gives you a stroke volume. Then if you multiply it by heart rate, you cardiac, a cardiac output. So you can do all this, but there's a lot of caveats to this. The first one is, well, we standardized, it, standardized this by measuring your LVOT. And if you look at this, oops, it's a picture here. I have my parasitic long axis. I've measured my LVOT as best as I can on a very calcified valve. And I had up here with 18 millimeters. But really, do I know exactly where I'm at? Well, the answer is I can certainly be underestimating a lot of it or overestimating depending on how I'm angled. And these are CT tomographies of the actual LVOT. And you can see that you can go up from 2.8 to 2.4 centimeters of difference. And that's a huge difference because you're 
doing half of that squared, and I can change your cardiac output a fair amount. So the LVOT is not round, it's ellipsoid, and that can affect you. And then where you measure exactly will have an impact on your actual um, cardiac output calculation. But we can get through that uh, for the simple reason that there's, if you're looking at your change over time, it doesn't really matter what your exact cardiac output is, is what it changes to. And that's what we tend to use more critical care. But be mindful that your actual output might not be the exact appropriate number. The other thing is, if we look at this, can people tell me what could be wrong on this picture and the way it's being done? There's something that's not quite there for what we're looking at. And I'm not gonna wait very long. If in 10 seconds I'm gonna answer, we have no time, I'm just gonna keep going. All right, I'm gonna keep going. Basically, it's on the title, but if you look at this, the alignment's really not superb. You have an angle there because your LVT is actually going more at an angle than this. And if you look at the tracing there, notice how they're not like the tracing we had earlier. Uh, hold on, right here. They're a little bit flat, they're not as well defined. These are tracing that are probably underestimated overall. And this can lead to you understanding your VTI and understanding your cardiac output. So if you do a single reading, you might say, oh, this, is, this looks low, whereas it might not be as low as you think it is. Um, this is a good example of those two things. This is a clip I, I still of the previous image. And you can see that this is much nicer, better aligned, better signal for a number of reasons. That's not just an alignment thing, but these signal have to be taken into context. You have to be careful that you're getting the best signal you can that should look the closest to this than you can. And how you trace it then is looking at the upper baseline here and using that as to when you have a reversal signal to know where to end. Uh, and that would be the clicks of your valves there and there that are opening and closing. So again, alignment is, is to re repeat it because that's one of the major things with VTI is alignment, alignment, alignment. Make sure you're on the right spot when you do this. You have the good alignment. What you end up getting to also is, as we talked about, you have pulse wave Doppler, you can get aliasing. And that on the left is a good, good example. There's a wrap around, and you can see the tip of this at the top because it doesn't really know when it's exceeding the speed that's traced here, um, what to do with this. So it starts putting it above the baseline. If you change it and you readjust it to minus 120, then you end up with the actual signal and you lose your aliasing at the top because the pulse wave is now essentially listening uh, at the right frequency to be able to, um, at the right duration to be able to catch a maximal signal. All right, I don't know if that makes sense to everyone. So this is another example of, of how you have aliasing. It's a mitral valve in this case, but it gives you an idea how to adjust it. So the first one, that's a very nice clip for that, is first your baseline, you can shift it. So you can now just show on the screen what actually is going on. That's the first thing. Then you can start shifting your speed to increase your maximal temporal resolution, uh, velocity, I'm sorry. So you can now eliminate your whole aliasing. Uh, and that's very important to do to optimize your signal to be able to get the right tracings. Now, you don't wanna be close to, uh, let's say this, where you say, well, it looks good enough. You might have much of a higher peak than you think if you're not optimizing the best way. The other thing to be mindful about when you look at aortic valve and VTI specifically is the impact of pressure calibration and volume that are regurgitated through the valve and across. And aortic regurg has a big impact on your VTI, and you can see it from mild, moderate to severe AR. You have a VTI that's 12 centimeters, 18, and 36. Now the question is, does this actually represent my cardiac output? Well, I don't know because why I have this is because I have flow coming back into the aorta and then back into my LV and I have to re-eject that flow all the time. So my VDI is increased. It doesn't mean that it's my forward flow, effective forward flow that's going the rest of the body. And so VTI has this little thing that if you have a significant regression and lesion and you have to recirculate a lot of volume, then you end up falsely elevating hits. And it might not represent necessarily what you're uh, your actual forward flow to the rest of the body is. Um, and there's ways to calculate using Doppler that can be done, but are way beyond 
the, the scope of this lecture, but you can account for it if you, if you, you have a bit more advanced echo training. Um, this is about all I'll say for aortic regurge, uh, to be honest, because it's, it's one of the most um, humbling uh, echo thing to do is that you always kind of underestimate it or overestimate it. There's a lot of things you can do, such as pulsing your, your aorta, your aortic heart in the same aorta. You can do vena contracta, we'll talk about a bit later in, this, in, in another context. But for the most part, it's something that's more and more moving to the realms of MRI where you can quantify actual volumes going through and forth. All I can tell you is that if you have something that's a lot of signal that seems to be wide at the base, which is the vena contracta, or seems to be for the past the valve taking a lot of your LVOT, it's probably more significant than you think and it's worth getting an actual proper assessment. For the other things such as looking at your regurgitant signal, how dense it is, or how much of a pressure halftime, meaning how quickly you equilibrate your pressure across the valve. Very important, but again, there's a lot of pitfalls. Um, just a minute, sorry. Just a minute. Apologize for that. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of pitfalls, and I think that, that that on its own is worth a specific lecture for AR. So we won't talk much about it. But to give you a couple of nice clips, because they're nice to look at, uh, this is an apical for chamber with a significant amount of AR. And if you were to try to pulse it for, for the actual regurgitant jet, what you want to do is align it like this in an apical four chamber. And then you, you'd ensure, if you're doing this, that you have at least four meters uh, per second of maximal velocity if you do any of those regurgitant PhDs. Otherwise, it's not going to be valid. Uh, the other thing is here, it's a very severe AR with a back and forth. And you can see here what kind of we discussed to some extent is your, your VTI is very, very high velocities and probably a high volume of stroke volume coming through as well because you have so much back and forth. And there's physical exam signs for those internal medicine people associated with that. Uh, that's a lot of people don't care about anymore, but they're fun. Um, so for findings, this is kind of what we discuss. Uh, single density, the more dense it is, that means the more origin flow there is. It's very helpful to look at that. This is a big difference between very dense, very is pretty dense, but probably not as bad. And then there's qualitative things and the remembrance that if you're eccentric, then things look odd. And that's just a fact. We'll talk about it in, with another valve that we can have a better idea of. So one of the things people do a lot is passive leg raise uh, during echo. Uh, I think it's a very nice thing to do. I think you have to know exactly how to interpret it and what the context has been. It was studied for the most part looking strictly at VTI in patients that have sepsis. It is not necessarily re re reliable in a lot of other pathologies. Uh, and if you have cardiac dysfunction, I would argue that there's a lot of other things that can play. And a lot of people are quite responsive to volume initially for a number of reasons. Um, what it shows here is that if you're doing a proper passive leg raise, you would do a VTI pre and post, and you would look at how much your VTI has changed. And the change that, depending on the paper, between 15, 20% will tell you that there's responsiveness to volume. Whatever that really means is, is up to debate up to now. And I would tell you is one of the things to be mindful about is, is how narrow the study has been done for this, and people can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong with this. Um, and also to be mindful that when you're actually doing this, you, you have to mind two things, in my opinion, that are not accounted for in most of the texts that talk about this, is heart rate and persistence of the actual thing. Most people, you give them a bolus of something, you'll see a change in ETI just by stretch pressure through the heart. What you're trying to see is, does it actually improve other factors such as cardiac output? If your heart rate, drops and your VTI increases, well, good, it's a response to volume, but your cardiac output is not really answered. It doesn't mean volume was the answer. Uh, it might, because maybe a patient is actually an ARDS and probably was fine the way it was and you give him volume that might be not beneficial. Uh, the other thing is you have to look a little bit later. Like I would go back half an hour later and see if there's persistence because sometimes that, vol that volume under pressure will do something and then when you stop it and you wait a little bit later, you see that your VTI goes back to what it was and your heart rate not, goes back to what it was. And you don't really, 
know if if it's if it's as, as accurate as it is. So I would use caution for this. Now, what's interesting if you use sequential things, you can forego the whole concept of using. Um, I don't have the slide for some reason. Uh, having to account for your LVOT size and your cross-sectional area. Because if you're doing one to the other, your cross-sectional area should be the same. So you don't need to account for it if you're looking at a percentage change of actual VTI. What I like to do is I, and it's not bad about anything, is I multiply by heart rates. And I, I compare that instead because it gives me both at least two of the things during cardiac output and passive measurements um, rather than a single one. And it might account for a little shift of, of the heart rate change as well. Not validated, something I do, something to keep in mind when you're doing cardiac physiology. Now, the other thing we see a lot is LVT obstruction. On the left, I'm going to slow this down for people to see. You have what, what, what we would call SEM. Your LVT is more or less here. Your mitral valve is closing. And notice that it's closing, that the tip is mo moving slowly towards the actual LVOT and obstructing it. And it leads on the right to a very, very aberrant, very fast signal, because the more flow you have to go through a small little hole, the faster it has to go, which is why you have high velocity in this situation. And it's something that on first half, you're not looking for it. You will miss it unless you put color on and you start looking at this weird signal and you realize, well, that's not cool. That shouldn't be the way it is. And then often after that, if you're not specifically looking for it, you go to 2D and you pick it up. It's something that I would recommend if you're looking for it, put your collar, look, see if you have a signal that accelerates, and then zoom into your valve, take a clip and slow it down like I'm doing. Because if you slow it down, you go frame by frame, you can see very clearly and doing systole. Remember that your ventricle is now contracting. It is obviously blocking the LVOT in this situation and the collar confirms the visual 2D effect as well. That becomes important because the management will be quite different. Um, basically, uh, what this gives you on a spectral Doppler uh, flow is that on the right is T view where you see it in better in, in real time. Just, just a minute. Um, okay, uh, so uh, what you end up seeing is, is interesting, right? Because as your cavity becomes smaller and smaller, your your obstruction is going to get worse because your annulus and, and your actual LVOT is going to become smaller if there's less volume to distend the cavity. So it gives you a very particular called dagger shape uh, LVOT uh, thing. And if you look at it, it actually starts a nice velocity. And the velocity increases as the actual orifice that the flow has to go through becomes smaller and becomes pointy at the end. And that's a dagger shape or for an LVOT obstruction. This is a very dramatic example, but it can lead to pressures that are really, really high. If you were to do this at 600 centimeters per second, you get a pressure that's north of, well, 157 here. And that's a lot of pressure for the LED generate at the end of this contraction. So this is a very elegant way to demonstrate that you have a significant LVT obstruction. If you compare it to other clips we'll have there, this is a normal where your velocity goes up and down more or less at the same speed. I'm gonna beg you guys to please, let's not talk about AS very much. Because AS on its own, again, is, is very, very complicated to deal with and give it justice. What I would tell you is that AS is humbling as well. Um, the, for velocities, you have to be very well aligned. And often, you have to go to unconditional views to get your maximal velocities. Such a view is called the parasynal view in transthoracic echo. And up to 30 to 40% of patients, that's where you get your maximal velocity. And it's not a standard view. So what I would tell you is for the critical care user, look at a 2D. I mean, it's not complicated just to look at and see that this valve is not good. It's calcified, it's not really opening very much on the left here. And so it's probably abnormal. Probably this, there's some degree of significant stenosis, but it's hard to quantify. In this case, this one was a severe one, but I'll point you to evidence number two on the right here. Evidence number two, if you look at this, well, it also doesn't look normal. It also doesn't look like it's opening very well, but it's not a good image. This was just simple, mild stenosis. Now, they look different, but this one doesn't look normal either. And yet, you get that, that uh, only mild stenosis. So I would tell people, for spectral or for stenosis, there's a lot of valuables involved. 
for the novice user, look at the 2D. If it looks really abnormal, pulse it to see if maybe you're lucky and get a really, really high signal. If you don't know, just get somebody's help because it can be very tricky sometimes. How much time we have? In 15 minutes. Let's see how much we can do there. So, um, uh, pressure calculation in the air to ventricular way valves. Um, Match or is going to be your go to valve for all this stuff to give you a couple of examples. This is severe eccentric MR. And it's a nice clip because as you're going through it and you go step by step, you see that you start, goes posterior, wraps around in the back, and goes back to the front a little bit as well on the off chains here. And that's very, very, very severe MR. Um, it can be quite obvious. It can also be not that obvious to quantify well if you have a very eccentric jet. Sometimes they're much more eccentric and they're very hard to quantify well. What never lies, in my opinion, is a very bad 2D defect. Let's be honest here. If you have a hold in your valve, it's probably gonna be severe. And in this case, if you have a hole that's a centimeter, if you were to measure this a good centimeter long or close to, it doesn't matter what your color Doppler is. That's a problem, it's probably severe. And I would say that's the first step to do. If your 2D is really bad, it is very likely something significant and your color can lie. It can help you in situations where 2D is not clear either and you're kind of in the fringe zones. But if you have a big defect, answer is usually there. And that's one, one of uh, my old mentors used to say is, if you have good 2D, you don't need Doppler. If you have shitty 2D, Doppler is sometimes useful, but it also lies a lot. So um, this is another thing to keep in mind when you're looking at regression thing. And this is a concept of jet area, where you're looking at how bad an AR and MR jet. People often look at the color in the actual uh, atria. Now, this, for those that look at a lot of echo, is mitral stenosis, but it also has a segment of, of MR. Why did I pick this picture? It's because this atria is the size, if not bigger, than the ventricle. So while I have a jet that goes only to half of it, well, you know, it's like, it's probably would wrap around if I have a normal size um, uh, mitral valve. Now in this case, the regurg is probably not all that bad for other reasons, but it makes you realize one thing is that your jet area and how much it occupies at the LA is dependent both on the pressure gradient across, but also on the receiving pressure of the cavity and the size of the cavity. So keep in mind that you have to look at the cavity size and keep in mind that your receiving pressure also influence how much flow actually goes backwards. If I have in mitral stenosis, not that huge of a flow, but I have re, uh, pressure in the LV, it might be much lower than you think. But in my LA, I have much higher pressure than usual, let's say 10 of uh, LA pressure is now 40, then I might get much less of a flow gradient across my valve. And it might be a big hole. It might not look like much under color. Um, if you integrate the whole thing, then you start looking into um, uh, things like that. Um, and let me just jam. We're going to switch to something else first. So this is an eccentric jet, and it applies the question of the quant effect. And it goes back to what we talked about initially. If it wraps around, it might not take a big area of your LA, but it might be quite severe. And that's because your kinetic energy, if it's hitting a wall in the eccentric jet, get absorbed by the wall. And you might not actually get much velocity. You might lose part of velocity that way. And so that jet, if it was central in the middle, might take the whole LA. So whenever you see an eccentric jet, you almost have to assume it's probably a little bit worse than it is. And you have to not necessarily upgrade significantly severity, but at least think that you might have to upgrade it one category. So be careful of this. In this case, what confirms that it might be more severe than you think is twofold. One, it wraps around, goes all the way to the back. Second is the pizza, which is a little mushroom there, just before the valve uh, is quite big. So let's talk about pizza. Um, pizza is a nice little picture and it's never this perfect, I have to say, unless you're on TE. Um, the pizza is that mushroom effect just before the valve uh, that is essentially that hemisphere upon which you're close to your, the hole of your valve. And at which point, as we talked about, 
the smaller the hole, the more the velocity. What's cool about this is it's a nemosphere. As you're getting smaller in your hole, the velocity is going to increase in a semi-predictable way. And for the most part, this is relatively, to some extent, or at least less dependent on the receiving chamber pressure. It depends a lot more on the actual hole size than it does on pressures across the valve. So whenever you have issues with really big LAs or very poor EFs sometimes, the PISA can tell you a little bit more about what the size of the hole is because that's more independent. You have to be mindful of how you do it. And here, this is what they say. It's been measured, validated at alien velocities that are much slower uh, than what you would normally look at your actual color jets. And that's so you can get a nice hemisphere. The vena contracta is also displayed here and that's the narrowest portion. And that's also is a lot more uh, pressure independent uh, and after independent uh, than other simply color-based things. Um, one of the problem with this is that you need to have a pretty circular hole. And if you don't have a pretty circular hole, it's sometimes quite flat. And that's an example of a very problem when you're looking at tracuspid valve because the tracuspid valve being three leaflet often has a star shape hole. And then you end up with very flat things and it becomes quite hard to know if your PISA is effective like accurate or not, it might be undervalued. But it's another thing to look at. And personally, this is one of the things I look at probably the most to decide on severity. If it's a big pizza and I get a nice one, big mushroom, it's probably gonna be worse than, than, than I think it is, or at least than what the receiving chamber jet area will look like. So now if you look at spectral Doppler using the mitral valve, there's a couple of things we can talk about now. As we said, this is mitral stenosis, but the really nice hockey stick thing here, where you, you can see that it's like restrained at the two edges, and so it can't open all the way. What can you do with this? Well, you can trace your, um, your jet across, and you can do on the bottom part, your actual uh, velocities, trust the valve, maximum velocities to figure out if you're getting uh, a very, um, uh, uh, very much a narrow uh, thing based on the increased velocity through a small hole. Same principles we discussed before. God. J'ai des chances sur l'intensif. J'ai des chances sur l'intensiviste de garde. Bonjour. Oui. <laughs> Oui. Mm -hmm. Ah. Euh, la zone, en fait, il y, y a certains patients qui sont possibles de congé, il faudrait parler à nouveau chier. Euh, je pense. Euh, Oh, pour aux, so aux soins et tout ça, euh, écoutez, moi, c'est quasiment impossible de, de faire ça. On n'a pas de personnel actuellement. Euh, je suis en train de donner une conférence. Est-ce que je peux vous rappeler dans 15-20 minutes? C'est correct, juste, je ne savais pas c'était quoi. Alors, je voulais juste être sûr que j'avais la chance de le prendre. OK. Parfait. Oui, parfait. Je remercie. Au revoir. Okay, uh, sorry about that. So, uh, but if you just look at the color, you can already see that the color is really, 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 really quite fast. You're analyzing at high velocity, which suggests that this is uh, significant noises, even with just looking at the color. As often as you start looking at it, you look at a 2D color and then you start doing your Doppler and you get your areas. Um, you do see that this is a very intense signal, meaning there's a lot of flow going through. And this is a, for the, the regurgitant part, a much lower signal it tells you maybe that's a little bit less of an interesting or important regurgitant we think it is. So, but I'll show you another example of looking at this, right? If you look at this and you look at your, your flow forward, in some instances, it actually looks quite fast at the beginning. So this, this also, but what you end up seeing though is you have significant MR. And that's the whole principle as we talk about with AR. If you have flow back and flow forward, 
the velocities in, in, um, can, can increase quite significantly and look much more like a mitral stenosis than it actually is just if you have significant MR. Uh, and it's something to pay attention to when you're looking at this is not to miss your MR and see if that's the reason it's getting worse. And there's ways to go across this using pressure half times and bad value calculations that are beyond the scope uh, of, this, um, of this lecture. Um, but the idea is this, is because flow is influenced by the amount of volume going through and the speed at which it needs to go through, stenotic lesions are very much influenced by how much uh, regression lesions there are, and especially Doppler calculations. So be mindful of that. This is a classic tricuspid valve. And just to show you guys again, you align it based again on the maximal velocity because for tricuspid, what you're looking at is the maximal signal, which tells you the maximal pressure generated at the time. Um, and then you get a, C, a CW through in this situation to get your maximal one. It is based on to pressure on the Bernoulli's equation. And that's based on the other pressure gradient calculation. In a simplified model, your peak velocity equals 4v squared, your maximal velocity, which is why you can use either, depending on what you're doing, but in, PW, in CW for tricuspid valve, you get your speed, your maximal one, you get your pressure. This is the pressure in tricuspid valve across the valve. You need to know what your receiving chamber pressure is. You need to way to estimate your RA pressure because that actually gives you your RV systolic pressure at the time. It's the pressure that the RV needs to generate to go to give flow to the RA, but it needs to take into account that RA. Um, and so you have to find a way to do that. Now you can do it by echo using the, um, uh, IVC. Uh, the issue with that is that, well, the IVC calculation for pressure for the most part is, is significantly studied only, although there's a little bit of data out there, it was validated for outpatients. It doesn't necessarily apply to patients on mechanical ventilation or in the ICU. And so we don't really necessarily uh, use it as the best thing. Better probably for what it's worth is to use a CDP tracing using an uh, invasive um, monitoring. So if you were to do one, to give you an example on how to get it, you would align perfectly on your maximal signal. You get this, you trace it over time, and you get your maximal velocity with the densest signal you can get. You'd pause it, and then you would go at the peak. Now, this calculates the systolic pressure, clearly, because I'm looking at maximal pressure. However, one of the things that can be done, and actually has been valid to be better than SPAP and more reliable is looking at your max, your mean PAP. And you do that by doing a VTI of all your velocities over your signal or your tricuspid valve. And if you look at this, it's a beautiful signal. You trace it. Here, it might have taken, you notice that we cut a little bit close here. It might be a little closer, maybe better. I don't want to take all that garbage at the end there, all that hair. I want to take the long thing. But what I get is I get a mean PAP. And if I add my RAP to this, then I end up getting my actual main, main, main PAP. And that's very powerful uh, when you're trying to evaluate pulmonary hypertension patients. Might be, and as I said, for data, it's actually more reliable than an SPAP. Um, what you can also do in a more, not really advanced, but it's less used, more unusual, um, but done in a lot of echo labs is you can do it using your promoter regurge gradient using your CW. You can then get, it would make sense. If you have it on the tricuspid valve, you can have it in the pulmonary valve and that's even closer than the PA. So you might get your better pressures. When you end up doing, if you were to cut it like this, is you would align this. Oh God, this was a little bit too long. I thought I'd cut this. Um, you end up getting it here. You have your PR. You align it quite well. You get a CW through, and then we'll start in a second. So it's just CW, nice little diamond shape. Alignment can be tricky sometimes, and that's not necessarily the easiest view to get. So you don't always have it. And then you end up getting on the top line your PR. If you have a very nice line with the first one here, you can actually do calculations on that to figure out your mean PP and your diastolic pressure. Which one are they? The peak early diastolic velocity is your, uh, I don't want to mess this up right now. <laughs> it's been a long night. Uh, between your mean and your end is your PDP. Um, and so 
Uh, that's another way to get it when you don't get to track a speed valve gradient. How often can you do this? Probably not as often as a track a speed valve, but you know it's not unusual either if you're looking forward to be able to do it. One of the things I like about this picture we have to talk about is a little bit signal density as we talked about before. All right, look at this picture. I have a first signal of TR that's barely legible. Then I get the signal that's much more legible. What happened there? Well, there's a couple things that can happen. First off, I might just be catching the signal better. Second off, the signal might be, might be aberrant and vary. As an example, when you have AFib and abnormal filling. The point of this picture is the following is, you can underestimate things if you don't get a good signal, if you don't catch something. And that's very dangerous because some people can call no, no um, pulmonary hypertension on something and say, well, if I actually put it there, it's 35, so it's fine. If I put it there, because I kind of see it, it's probably fine. But if you actually get the real signal, it looks much worse. The other thing it tells you is you need to have as much as you can a good signal density and a good top tracing to be able to get to your maximal PP. You need to see the rounding. Also, how dense a signal is probably tells you how much of a TR you have. It's not perfect, but if you have a significant amount of density in there, it's probably more than that. Um, what's this one here? So this is a good example of, uh, of uh, what seems to be very little TR, right? Uh, let's go at it again. So maximal jets, like most people would call this a speckle of something, maybe mild, maybe eccentric, nothing crazy, right? This uh, next one. Ugh. So this is that same patient, a different spot with a different jet. The PAP is 85. It's super dense. Uh, and somehow I don't have the picture, but he had at least moderate TR. I just didn't catch in that view. And it tells you that whenever you do any spectral or color Doppler, you have to go in multiple places because you can significantly underestimate your actual amount of TR and then your gradients. So it's too bad it didn't say for some reason, but I have the same echo with the same guy with moderate TR taking an apical view. Uh, and a very different signal. On the other view, you get barely anything. In this one, you get a very dense signal. And we'll finish with, almost on time, uh, with diastology and tamponades that I kind of put together because you're using the same tools. Or as I like to call it, how to confuse a cardiographer. The premise of this is you get this from the guideline. And that's a second out of two algorithms. My take on this is, when you have something that has arrows going everywhere and things that cross section, depending on what much criteria you have, something's wrong. When you talk to people who actually design those guidelines, they'll tell you, well, you know, when 30% of your patients fit in the indeterminate region, probably something not quite right with this. And I think the way we have to think about diastology is we're looking at a patient that we don't have a structural basis to think they would have something and they come in with signal that would fit with something else. And if you look at the first parts of the algorithm, that's what it's trying to say. Uh, the one that you don't have here, the first segment, is anybody who has something like very thick walls, aortic stenosis, depressed EF, uh, you know, obvious known amyloid, things like that, this doesn't apply. It doesn't matter what it tells you. This is for the guy where you're like, well, he goes in a little bit of CHF, or he's a little bit short of breath, but we're not sure, sure why. Um, and maybe he's got diastolic abnormality and trying to find the extremes or to prove that it's normal, 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 normal. So this is valid in our patients. It doesn't really apply to critical care, but I've seen it try to be used more and more. In my opinion, at least in the general critical care world, there's probably not a ton of value for this. You're probably better off looking at long ultrasounds to see if there's actual B lines that are shifting and changing depending on what you're doing rather than use it diastology. Certainly in sepsis, what the problem is, is that sepsis causes, if you look at different papers, in, depending on your phase of sepsis and how much filling you have, very, very restrictive or very, very compliant uh, LVs. And so you don't even know how to use that depending on where you're at in the process of sepsis to fill or unfill your patient. So I would be very cautious to use diastology in most of the applications outside of outpatient cardiac surgery, where there's links to it, or very clear post-op cardiac situations. 
ideally, you get something like this. You get a really nice thing here that's moving very, very nicely. Uh, very clean tracing, E on A, you measure your uh, early diastolic and then your HL kick, which is the A, E is the, like the diastolic maximal velocity and then A is the maximal atrial velocity after HL contraction. And then you look at your under tissue Doppler, both lateral and septal um, velocity of the actual tissue. Now, these are the tracing for that guy. What's wrong with this guy's heart if I keep moving through it? Well, for the purpose of time, I'm just gonna say it like it's, there's calcium everywhere. So is that E prime that's not moving telling me much about diastology? Well, not really because that wall is just not gonna move at the septum, there's so too many calcium. It doesn't mean that there's necessarily significant compliance to diastolic problem. Now, I'm not saying that this guy doesn't have it. He likely has it for a bunch of other reasons, lead it to why he has calcium. But the fact is diastology is not valid in this patient because your marker is influenced by all this. So what affects the ability to do diastology? As we said, you need to be able to do an ENA, appropriate saying good windows. You need to be able to have a muscle at the base that's relatively normal. So anything that has a mitral valve intervention, prosthesis, calcium, not valid, you can't do tissue doctor on it. Anybody who has constriction or restriction, well, it's stopping the annulus from moving on the left side. Well, it's not gonna work. Anybody who has significant RV dysfunction, the septum doesn't move quite well because your RV is kind of also impaired. So there's a lot of things that make diastology quite unreliable. And I would caution people without a lot of knowledge about using it because you can get into real trouble and overcall or undercall things. A good example of this, again, is somebody with significant RV dysfunction. That RV is here, it's humongous. That LV is functioning super, super well, but that septum here, it's not moving very much. And if you actually do your tracing here, it doesn't look like it's moving at all, but the LV is not a problem. Diastology might be abnormal, might be completely normal. Certainly systole is perfect. so. Maybe this guy actually has normal diastology, but this will trick me. Also, this guy will have a significant TR that's super, super high because it's pulmonary retention. That's a criteria technically to apply for, for diastology, but doesn't apply here. So you have to be mindful of those two things. Is my annulus normal? Is my is myocardium normal for diastology? And then is, is my RV normal in this specific instances? The other thing that applies to all these things, and I put at the end as a bit reminder, is atrial fibrillation, okay? Atrial fibrillation with abnormal filling will mess up your color, your spectral Doppler for all your valves. Um, we have validated it to be able to do it anyway for specific things. As an example, when you have aortic stenosis or VTI and so on, you will average out multiple different ones. And then the average will give you more or less where the heart is. You can also pick your best beat that will be closest to two or three beats in a row, 60 to 80 or 90, depending on what speed you think the patient should be at. And then you can get that VTI right after and kind of get an idea uh, what would be the optimal VTI for the patient. But over, overall, you can just average it. However, you can't do is diastology because formally for diastology, you need an E on A. And well, logically, if you don't have, if you have elevation, you don't have an A, so you can't do it. Uh, there's ways to estimate LVEDP, technically by extreme using your E on E prime. It has been validated, again, validated in outpatients, not necessarily in patients that are sick in the ICU. So I would use significant caution on that. But for those that really wanna know, E on E prime less than eight. So E being this one and E prime being what's trying here, less than eight might suggest low LVEDP above 15 might suggest high LVDP. Now the question is, what are you gonna do with it? Because we've never validated that you should be doing something with this. Maybe this guy needs high feeling pressures for a number of reasons. So I, don't, I would not use this kind of things personally, but people pretty disagree to decide to diaries my patient. I would put it in context of the whole story. Maybe look at the lungs, that might be, tell you a bit more. If you have this, the lungs, patient that's anasarchic, normal LV function, yeah, maybe, maybe that's your answer. Um, but I would use, are you caution? 
Hey, hey John, I, I got we, I have to run here. I have a meeting right now. So sounds good. Thank you so yeah. much for presenting. I really appreciate it. Fantastic and, uh, work. Cheers. That's my last slide is for, for, for phasic changes. And that's just to remind you guys that my mechanical ventilation messes everything up. Uh, it, it will, we normally have inspiratory, inspiratory variation uh, and, and shifts in the outputs and pressures. We don't notice them quite, quite mild the patient that's going negative pressure ventilation if they have normal heart and normal lungs. However, when you're on positive pressure ventilation, those things can be quite exacerbated. And that's why when you look uh, in your, let's say, your um, arterial line pulsatility and changes, you have to be mindful that you need a patient that's paralyzed, completely ventilated properly, and there's no significant shift, and you can look at your variation. But that's also assuming you have a normal RV, normal PVR, et cetera. And so the, where this becomes important when you're trying to use the markers we use for tamponade assessment is that, well, you know, in a patient that's intubated around the sick and so on, then that, you don't know what to do with them. This guy, uh, this is not a mitral valve, it's a tricuspid valve. What you do in a patient like this, and you do a really long tracing, you pick your E on maximal inspiration, expiration, and see what the shift did. And depending on the paper, 20, 30% would make you think there's significant respiratory radiation. But again, compounders, you can have restriction, you can have RV dysfunction. In this case, the RV is normal. Uh, you can also be at a very bad angle and then your shift might not be the extra percentage because you're not catching your maximal velocities. What I can tell you is looking at this, I don't really care what my variation is for this patient. If I look at my atrial contraction and then I look at opening and at the end, I see that I have a shift of my LA and there's definitely increased intraparietal pressure regardless of my, my spectral Doppler does. And I'm going to go one step further, despite being in the corporate geographer, is it really is more of a clinical whole picture kind of thing. Look at the clinical. If the guy looks like in tamponade and your echo person from echo says, well, I don't really think there's no obvious sign of variation is not there and so on, but the patient's clearly in shock and there's an effusion and the whole thing fits with tamponade based on history and physical exam and so on. I mean, you have to maybe disregard some of the echo findings and just go with where the money is. Um, definitely, I would look a lot more at 2D than I would for a lot of those variation uh, spectral Doppler things, but they're useful in the complicated case and they definitely can be useful in constrictive pericarditis that can be a confounder in this setting. That's pretty much what I had for this in a really potpourri of all the big things. Um, I have a couple minutes. Uh, we over time, of course. I understand people have to go, but if anybody has any questions about or comments about all this, this is a quick done in 72 hours presentation. So there's possibly things that I'm not, uh, I haven't thought about saying, or maybe I forgot having not done this in a long time. Thanks, John, for presenting. I'll just speak on behalf of the POCUS group here. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a complicated topic, obviously, going through all of Doppler, all of color, all of pulse wave and continuous wave. But just for the people who are online that may be just kind of getting their feet wet with these concepts, because they're always, you know, quite um, difficult to grasp. In what instances would you say that you can get away with diagnosing things uh, specifically like versus stenotic versus regurgitant? Um, and then what uh, like what times would you use color to kind of get a basis of the diagnosis? When would you use continuous wave? And when would you use pulse wave? Just kind of for everybody to get the basics. Obviously there's lots of caveats as you mentioned before, but just kind of the basics to everything. So listen, um, I think any atrioventricular valve or gurgitant lesions are fair game with color. Yep. And most of the time, that's a lot of what we base ourselves on. For the simple reason that a lot of the Doppler things we do uh, can be very subjective, catching the beam the right way. Uh, and a lot of times, we just use our eye in the echo lab to figure this out. And people can correct me if they have a different view. Uh, we use PISA, you know, contract all these things in a more measured way for research, yes, but also to confirm the weird and kind of borderline cases. I would say mostly to say this patient needs surgery or doesn't need surgery. 
I think that would be the, the main thing. So I would say for atrial ventricular uh, regression lesions, that's all good. For stenotic lesions, you need your pulse wave and continuous wave Dopplers to figure it out as well, for the most part. It is very difficult to figure out what color for anything that's uh, anything sound of very severe, in my opinion, or at least significantly, like very, very, like severe, at least severe. Anything below severe, it's a crapshoot, I would say, with just color. Uh, I personally think that um, looking at the valve is in a lot of situations actually one of the um, definitive things for the simple reason. Okay, I actually am going to have to go. I apologize. I I'm getting a staff or something. So no problem. Sorry is about okay, that. Is it okay if I quickly summarize for you, John? Like it's, it's okay. Yeah, let's just head off. Yeah. So have a good day, everyone. Bye. Yeah, bye. Thanks for everything. Uh, so for the group, I think uh, for the most part, John uh, had mentioned before that for regurgitant lesions, putting a color box over the valve, putting that box specifically over the valve and the regurgitant um, chamber that it's going to go to. So for example. For TR, it's going to go to the right atrium. For MR, it's going to go to the left atrium. And for AI, uh, we won't talk about PI very much, but you put the box specifically over the LVOT for that. And for most regurgitant lesions, especially for uh, you know the severe lesions, if it takes up the 40% of the chamber it's going to for TR and MR, or it hits the back wall or has that eccentric jet, that can be called severe. So that's 40% for TR, MR hitting the back wall or the coanda effect or that kind of curling effect. For AI, if it takes up 65% of the LVOT or it hits the uh, LV uh, back wall, uh, basically at the apex, that can be considered severe. All the other stuff, the vena contractin, all the things that he mentioned, PISA and things like that, those are advanced techniques. And it's nice to add in a uh, continuous way for those things, but it's not necessary uh, for regurgitant lesions. As he mentioned before, for stenotic lesions, you do need to use continuous wave because you need to find the peak and the mean velocities for those. So typically in cardiology or in uh, cardiac surgery or in ICU or in anesthesia, the typical lesions we worry about would be on the left-hand side. So it would be AS and MS. And then just doing an envelope trace of, uh, you know, that really thick envelope that he mentioned before and kind of getting your peak and mean gradients. There's always caveats to this. If the LV is bad or the LA is bad, you might be not be able to get those um, gradients. But overall, we're, like hopefully we can demystify that these things can be captured by intensivists and people who are trained. And the general start to everything is the regurgitant lesions are color and then the stenotic lesions are continuous wave. Pulse wave is used primarily for cardiac output, as he mentioned, the LVOT. And the last thing it's used for at, at the back of his talk was diastolic dysfunction, as well as looking at tamponade. Again, advanced techniques, but uh, things that could be learned along the way. All right, so thanks for everybody joining. Uh, I'll just um, you know sign off on behalf of Jean as well as Brian. Thank you for everybody, and we'll see you guys next week or, or whenever next time this is gonna happen, okay?